tell me when you're ready. Our text this morning is going to come from Psalm 139. Psalm 139. You'll be turning there. As has already been stated, we have designated this Sanctity of Life Sunday. We have some suggestions of prayer that we can unite together. Our prayers before the Lord. We can pray that God will transform the hearts of mothers for the life of their unborn child. We can pray together that God will give men courage to stand up for their unborn child. We can pray God convicts the hearts of everyone who recommends, provides, or encourages abortions. We can be in prayer right now as this Texas heartbeat law makes its way through the system. It's before the Texas Supreme Court. It'll ultimately be decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. So I encourage you to make all of these things a matter of prayer that this shame, this disgrace that has plagued our nation since 1973 can finally be ended. <clears throat> Sister Michelle is going to help us um, with this, with a song that she's going to sing, and then we'll go right into our message after this song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Tiny fingers, tiny toes, tiny eyes, and a tiny nose. We're so tiny, but heaven knows we don't get a chance to grow. Little hearts beating little beats, little kicks from little feet. Yes, we're little, but oh so sweet. So mom and dad, why didn't you keep me? Oh Lord, please tell them, stop killing your children, all in the name of choice. We need somebody to stand up and speak for us, for we have no voice. Since Roe versus Wade, the heartbeats of more than 62 million unborn babies have been silenced by abortion. That's more than all the combined casualties of every major war in which the United States has been involved. It's time that we take a stand and give them a voice. Now I lay me down to sleep. I thank you, Lord, my soul you keep. If I should die before I'm born, please forgive mom and daddy, Lord. Oh, Lord, please tell them, stop killing your children, all in the name of choice. We need somebody to stand up and speak for us, for we have no voice. We need somebody to stand up and speak for us. Won't you be our voice? 
Will we be the voice for those who have no voice? For the unborn whose lives have been and are being thrown away? They are a creation of God. They are a person, a human, just as important as any of us. Precious little lives. Look with me at Psalm 139. I'm going to begin reading in verse 13. Psalm 139. Would you stand with me as we read from God's Word? Verse 13 says, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought or skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect and in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them they are more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with Thee. Let's pray. Dear Father, we bow before You today with shame. Ashamed, God. That in this land that's been so blessed, receive Your goodness as a nation, we've been guilty of snuffing out 62 million innocent little lives. Meaningful little lives. Precious little lives. What could some of them have done? Some may have been a great scientists and found discoveries for illness. If they had been allowed to live out their life. Some of them may have been a great evangelist and led thousands to Christ if they had only been given a chance. God, today, will you show mothers that you love them and that through your love, they can love their baby. Will you show mothers that you'll make a way, that it's not hopeless, that you'll be there for them and with them all the way? Will you show dads that it's a life? It's not an id, it's not a fetus, a life. It's a baby, his offspring. Will you convict the hearts of those who provide abortions and recommend abortions? Will you convict their heart and show them that it's wrong? Today, God, use your word to instill these truths in us that every life is yours, every life is precious, every life is meaningful. We again confess our sin and ask for forgiveness and ask for your help. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. <coughs> How can human parents love a child that they've never even met? How many times have you seen a mom stroking her belly like she's just like she's rubbing a little baby's back or something? <laughs> Already so in love with that baby and never even met them. Well, I'll tell you how. Because of the love of God shown to her, she can direct that love then to her, to her baby, knowing that it's a gift from he or she is a gift from God. It's being created by God in her womb, 
in His image. God sets His love upon us even before we came into existence. The Bible said that He loves us, He knows us, and, and, and has a plan for us even before we were born. Verses 15 and 16 here said, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect or unformed, wasn't, wasn't formed yet. And in thy book all my members were, were written, which in continuance were fashioned or in process. Two cells, you know, a cell divided and there were two and two and there were four and and they divided and there were eight, and, and, and then 16, and 32, and 64, and when as yet there was none of them. David here is referring to himself. This is the only reference in Scripture to a human embryo in the womb. And God is there making it in secret. God was the first one to see you. God was the first one to know you. God was the first one to love you. Long before your parents ever did. Before any human decides about us, God knits us together or weaves us together in our mother's womb. He loves us before any human person can show love to us. He loves us with a first love, an unlimited love, an unconditional love. He wants us to be His beloved children. That's His goal, His plan, His desire for every baby, for every one. To be His beloved children. And He tells us to become as loving as Himself. Isn't that what he said? A new commandment I give to you? That you love one another? That wasn't new. He said that you love one another as I have loved you. That's the new part. Verse 13 and 14 said, For thou hast possessed my reins and hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. David says God formed him in the inward parts of his mother's womb. He declared that he was fearfully and wonderfully made. David knew nothing of the complex anatomy of the human body compared to what we know today. Yet he knew he was wonderfully made. He had no idea that the body has more than a trillion cells. He had no idea of the atoms and the molecules that make up each of those cells. He had no idea of the complex chemical processes happening in the cells every moment of every day to keep these bodies alive. Yet even without that detailed knowledge, David knew that he was a complex being, unique in God's sight, and the product of God's divine design and His skillful hand at work in creating him and bringing him forth from his mother's womb. I tell you, we are not the result of some big bang. Your ancestor never was a monkey. And no, those that try to justify, you know, faith and evolution because they consider evolution a proven fact, can I tell you, evolution does not even, does not even fit the, the, the scientific qualification of a theory. At least a scientific theory, by definition, has some evidence. There's no evidence of evolution in the world. Nowhere. Only in textbooks is there supposed evidence. But nowhere in the real world is there evidence. As a matter of fact, it might be defined as a hypothesis. A, 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 a guess that we put forth. But it does not... It has not been proven. And so for those that would try to say, well, God did it, but He did it through evolution. Can I tell you, you don't even realize what you're bringing up. Because if you cannot trust what God said in Genesis 1 and 2, 
You cannot trust what God said in any of the rest of the Bible either. You have to accept it all or throw it all away. You cannot pick and choose which parts. I'll tell you it's all true. It's true from cover to cover. It's true from Genesis 1 to all the way through Revelation. Okay? We can take God at His Word. And God, you are not the result of a big bang. You are the result of a loving God who very determinedly designed you and caused the, uh, you to develop properly. Or Maybe you think you didn't develop properly, but you did in God's sight because He loves you just as much as He did anybody else. For the one that says, well, you know, he's not perfect or she's not perfect or what? You're just as perfect as the one guy uh, the world might say is perfect in the sight of God. He loves you just as much. We are the result of the creative act of God who knit each human being together in our mother's womb. How else could something as complex as a human being come into existence except by the work of God? He watched our complexity de develop cell by cell from the moment of conception to birth. He watched with love, with determination, with a plan, with a purpose for each life. Verse 16 said, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect or unformed, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. More than any other verse in the Bible, this verse confirms human uniqueness of that which grows in the womb. It is not an appendage of the mother. It is a human being for whom God has a future in mind. I call your attention again. And in your book they were all written, the days uh, uh, fashioned for me, when as yet there was none of them. God had a determined plan. Listen to Job chapter 10, verses 11 and 12. Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and has fenced me with bones and sinews. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. God is recognized as having knit together Job. Zechariah, chapter 12. Wrong reference. Zechariah, chapter 12. And verse number 1 describes God forming the spirit of man within him. An obvious reference to giving life to man. The psalmist declares in Psalm 119 and 73, Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Just as God created Adam and Eve individually, God has created each of us and each little baby in the womb. We are learning with medical science, we are learning more and more about the viability of the baby at younger and younger ages. Outside the womb. For whatever reasons that sometimes babies come early and they're able to be cared for and survive at younger and younger ages now. Proving that that's a baby in the womb, a viable life in the womb. When Mary was pregnant with Jesus, she went to visit Elizabeth, who was pregnant with the cousin of Jesus, John. We know him as John the Baptist. The Scripture says that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting upon her arrival, that John leapt in her womb for joy. Luke chapter 1, verse 44. John leapt for joy upon hearing the voice of the mother of Jesus. John was an infant human responding emotionally to something before he was even born. 
The idea that human life doesn't begin at conception is unsupportable, both scientifically and from the testimony of scriptures. More and more scientists are beginning to reach the same conclusion that scripture has held from the beginning. That what is growing in the womb is a human being from the moment of conception. Immature, yes, but a human being nonetheless. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. This is a powerful statement about God's knowledge of our destiny and our future. Before we were born, He had a plan for us. That's what He told Jeremiah. Before you were born, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Before you were born, God had a plan for you and for your life. That baby that you're carrying in your womb, God has a plan for he or she right now. There are four truths in this one verse. First of all, it states that God states that I formed thee. Then he states that I knew thee. Then he said I sanctified thee. And then fourthly, I ordained thee. Jeremiah didn't become a prophet until decades after he was born. But before he was born, God knew that that's what he was meant to be. Because God had ordained him as a prophet in the womb. I believe that God has a plan for your life and for my life that predates our conception in the womb. Just as he had a purpose for Jeremiah, I believe he has a purpose for you and me. I'm asked more than any other question about finding God's plan for one's life. I believe the way to begin finding out is to say this to God. Lord, whatever it is you've created me to be and to do, I'm willing to be that person. Start out by saying that, meaning it. Don't pray, Lord, show me your plan. You know, and then I'll decide if I won't go along with it. That, that's the wrong prayer. Don't ask God out of curiosity. As a matter of fact, don't ask God. Tell God. Tell God, God, I'm willing to submit to your plan, whatever it is. As you reveal it to me, I'm willing to submit to your plan and your purpose for my life, whatever that is, He'll show you if we'll submit to it. Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all uh, the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He Him. Male and female created He them. Now this is the record of humankind being created in the image of God. In the image of God created He Him, male and female created He them. We think of image in terms of a child looking like one parent or both parents. That's the idea we have of image. But God has no physical being. God is a spirit. So image here cannot re refer to physical appearance. We bear the likeness of His character. We bear the likeness of His nature. We reflect God as who He is as a spirit. 
when we work, love, serve, exercise dominion, those are all reflections of how God does the same things. Even our emotions, as flawed as they may be, reflect the emotions of God. Only when we live in a way that reflects who we are as image bearers of God can we find and feel significance. The way a human parent feels about seeing a newborn who reflects who they are as parents is just a little glimpse, just a sliver of how God must feel about us. We think about the possibilities of our children when they're born. And we think that way because we're in the image of God. And that's how God thinks about us. It doesn't matter if we are perfect babies in the world's view or if we have some kind of challenging part. That it could be physical. It could be mental. See, with God, it makes no difference. He sees His image in us and He sees the possibility of our reflecting who He is throughout our life on this earth. You have the love of God and a divine destiny. And your child does. And I don't care what the doctor tells you about that child. You see, when my wife and I were with child, <clears throat> there seemed to be an issue. And he said, we need to have an ultrasound. And the... And the um, person that reads that ultrasound sent the report to the doctor and the doctor called us in. And Well, he says there's a problem, but the doctor said, I, I don't really believe it, but he says there's a problem. And we'll follow up. And so a month or two, whatever goes by, and he's called us in and he said, we need to do a follow up. And, and they did the ultrasound. The guy that read the ultrasound sent the report and the doctor called us in. And, and he said, well, he says it again. It's still there. It's supposed to be this. And my mind. And I said, what does that mean? I can't understand all of that. He said, well, what he's saying, what it means is you better love him and enjoy him while you have him because you won't have him very long. And, and, and then after that soaked in a little bit, he said, but listen, I still don't believe it. The only doctor in all the doctors that we had that, that went against what everything said was this one doctor this year. And he said, I still don't believe it. He said, I think it's a glitch. I think it's a gas bubble. I think it's, you know, whatever. He said, what are you going to do about it anyway? This is doctor, doctor's words. He said, what are you going to do about it anyway? Abortion, that's not an option. Hallelujah, that wasn't an option. What I'm telling you is whether the doctor says the baby's perfect or whether the doctor says the baby's not perfect, he's perfect in the eyes of God. Love him, enjoy him, and cherish him. And give him life, my friends. Encourage your children, grandchildren, loved ones. Give them life. They're a gift from God. We could name John Wesley, born into a large family, destitute, not knowing where their next meal was going to come from. James Robertson. Anybody know James Robertson? James Robertson, a great pastor and preacher to the church. Somebody tried to compare him one time to Billy Graham. He said, oh no, Billy Graham is an evangelist to the lost. God didn't send me there. God sent me to strengthen the church. And he's used his life to do that. He was, his mother was raped. He was a product of rape. Did you know that? By his own testimony. He was a product of rape. But his mother carried the child and had the child and God used him greatly. We could name others. Jesus of Nazareth. A 
unusual circumstances, right? All were conceived in very difficult circumstances and would have been candidates for abortion in today's culture. But think what would have been lost. There are no children conceived and born who are not loved by God and endued with divine possibilities. In my lifetime, women have gone from carrying babies to carrying fetuses. Why? To create an emotional disconnect between mother and baby. It's easier to abort a fetus than it is a baby. Many arguments have been set forth for when the embryo becomes a child, when it first moves, when it's born, when it breathes on its own. But we now know there's brain activity in the baby in just a matter of weeks. And the baby is moving all the time whether the mother feels it or not. Human potential begins to develop at conception. And regardless of the circumstances under which the child is conceived or the condition in which it arrives, the child bears the image of God and thus has purpose and possibility in God's sight. Our culture has created a terrible legacy by aborting more than 62 million. I looked it up this morning. As of this morning, 9 o'clock, 62 million babies killed since it was made legal. Our nation, whether it knows it or not, is laboring under a weight of guilt before God and these sins of murder. But God is also a God of compassion who's ready to forgive any such choice that a woman has made. If she'll only reach out and accept what God offers. God loves every child. But God also loves every mother. I don't know, there may be some listening to me who has had an abortion in the past. If you're in that category, God loves you. God desires to forgive you. God offers restoration. Please accept His forgiveness today. I believe with all my heart, if you're a Christian, you'll be reunited with that child that you never knew in heaven. You have an eternal reunion to look forward to. An eternity of joy to celebrate the love that you never were able to share together. Now, I'm not saying that you'll be that child's mother in heaven. That's not what I'm saying. But that child's in heaven. Safe. Under God's grace. Because it never had a chance. You too can be in heaven. That's all I'm saying. Not that you'll be the child's mother, but that you too can be in heaven if you will accept God's offer of forgiveness and salvation. The way to do that is to just come to God. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I've sinned greatly. God, forgive me. Forgive me, God. I know my sin's against You. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Jesus, I trust you as my Savior. I know I can't do it by myself, but I know you did all that was necessary. You paid for my sin on Calvary's cross. You died there. You rose again in victory. I trust you. I pledge myself to you. Be my Savior and help me walk after you. 
Preacher, how do I put all that in the right words? God knows your heart. We proved in Sunday school this morning that you don't have to have the right series of words. The thief on the cross said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And that was good enough. He didn't have all the right words. But Jesus knew his heart. And he knows your heart. If you're repentant, if you come to him in faith, he'll save your soul. He can forgive you of this. Any sin, any sin. If you're a prospective parent and you're struggling and you're wondering how, he's also the resource that you need. He'll, he'll help you and sustain you. And he'll love you enough that you can use some of that love to flow through you to your child. And He'll make a way. I want to encourage you today, as a people of God, stand up for those who have no voice. Speak up for those who have no voice. This is the best chance we've had since Roe v. Wade was made law. Let's pray. In our prayers, not only praying for that heartbeat law as it goes through the system, but also pray for moms that would have a God-given love for the child. For dads, that they would have a God-given love for the child, not see it as just a problem to get rid of. And by the way, for the born, little children are also thrown away and thrown about. And then also for God to convict those that recommend, endorse, and provide abortions that He change their heart and see that it's wrong. Let's stand. Dear Father, we thank You. We thank You so much, God, for Your Word. We thank You for Your love. And we thank You for the precious gift of life. Our little ones, our children, our grandchildren, our, our little ones, God, we thank You for. Help us to love them. Help us to love them right. Help us to protect them. Protect them in the womb and after the womb. And Father, I ask you today, there might be somebody listening that's struggling. She don't know how she's going to make it. She don't know what to do. And somebody's telling her the easy answers to get rid of it. Help her to know it's not a it. It's her baby. Help her to know that there's hope. That there's a way. That there are people who care. Father, there's somebody, or there may be somebody, who don't realize your design. and Maybe they've recommended abortion. Maybe, they're in a, maybe they provide. Help people get abortions. God, convict their heart. Show them that it's wrong. Show them that you love that baby, but you also love them. And you're willing to forgive them and, and restore, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, save them and take them into your family. God, I just ask for you to accomplish something great from your word. Not mine, but your word. In Jesus we pray. Amen.